Uh, tonight, one of the words, I just want to share with you just a journey that, you know, um, God and I have been on and my family have been on. And I'm just that kind of person where I feel like if I've been on a journey, we're all going on a journey together, right? I'm just going to take as many people with me as possible because I love to do life together with a lot of people. And, um, and so, uh, like many of you in this room, the way you would approach a new year um, is perhaps you would end the last year maybe reflecting and then goal setting, evaluating and then thinking, okay, maybe how can I set myself up for another year? And so like most people in this room, that's what I did. At the end of last year, I sat and I reflected, I gave God thanks, um, I ate lots of food and I celebrated, Hey, yeah, you did, yes, you did. And then uh, going into 2020, I just said, man, God, just speak. And I often ask God to give me a word and a phrase. Pastor Sam had already been speaking and talking about uh, the scripture uh, of full and overflowing and this theme that we were stepping into as a church. And as I was asking God, man, God, how, how do I walk into that? Because who wants to live a full and overflowing life, right? That's incredible. I want to live there. And so I'm the kind of person that asks God, that's a great idea, God, how? How does that happen for me? And so when I asked God these things, he gave me uh, one word and then a phrase. And that first word that he gave me was focus. Focus. I think the cultural climate we can currently live in is a climate of distraction. A climate where our attention can often be divided and it can be taken and stolen and it certainly is a very short attention span. And really God spoke that word focus and it reminded me of a time at the end of, towards the end of last year, my husband and I, for like our our jobs, we get to travel just a little bit around New Zealand and sometimes um, offshore. And as we went to go travel, I had the incredible privilege of flying to Whanganui. Let's go, right? Woohoo! On, you know, the, the Whanganui Airplane Domestic Airport. So it was the first flight, you know, early flight, and I go to the Auckland Domestic um, e- Airport, and I'm there, but unfortunately there's been cloud and fog, so much so that none of the planes are flying out. So there's a delay. The delay was six hours, right? Oh, yeah, you're already irritated. I can see it on, that's how I felt. Your faces, that's how I felt. And I was so irritated, but thank the Lord for Krispy Kreme and coffee at the Auckland Domestic Airport. So sister had a taste of every flavor, all right? It was a good time that I immediately regretted. And uh, after that, feeling very ill and just thinking, man, a six hour delay, I may as well have just driven to Whanganui. Uh, Finally, a notification on my cell phone, you may board your flight. So I'm excited, but still very frustrated and very irritated. And I get onto the tarmac and walking to the plane. And then I go to get on the plane and there's the air hostess. And she's, welcome. And I'm like, oh, that's frustrating that you're so happy. You've been delayed too. You know, like, how are you not mad? You know those people? You know those people when you walk into church and you had a hard week. You had a hard month right? You've had a hard six months and you walk in and in the meet and greet time, they're like, how you doing? Isn't God good? What a time. And you're like, oh yeah, cool, right? Don't judge me because I know you know how I feel. So anyway, she's super happy and I'm like, all right, okay, let's get on this airplane. And the airplane is the small kind that flies to Whanganui, right? So you can't have your cell phone on or your iPad on or anything. So I just sit there. And as I'm sitting there, irritated and frustrated and impatient, um, we're we're about to land because that's all that happens on an airplane when you fly to Whanganui, you just take off and then you land. And so that's all that happened. We took off and then we're going to land. So then as we go to land, I can see the Whanganui airport approaching. But what is more disturbing is that they're just, there are rumblings through the airplane and people are shifting in their seats and people are getting very uncomfortable And I'm thinking, what's going on? And you can feel the panic that's filling the airplane. And I'm like, what is going on? What's happening? And people are free. They're starting to freak out. And I just look at that air hostess. (laughs) Just sitting there, belted in. And then, you know, there's rum. And then the lady next to me, she says, oh, my goodness look outside your window. So I look outside the window, and this is what I see. Two things that are deeply disturbing. The first thing is that there are about 60 people at the airport, outside, with with 
with their cameras and their phones. And you must understand, at the Whanganui Airport at any one time, there's only ever three people there. <laughs> and so at this time, there's 60 people there. There are families there. There's children there. There are people there filming. There's news crews. There's radio stations, and they're filming. But more disturbing is that there are two fire trucks on the tarmac strip. And we are heading straight for them. I can see the firemen on top of the truck and they're holding their hoses. And immediately I start to freak out and sweat. I think I'm gonna die. I'm gonna die. This plane is gonna go up in flames. So as any good millennial, I took out my cell phone and I turned it on. I said, if I'm gonna die, I'm gonna film this. <laughs> right, we're going Facebook Live. That's what's going on, right? Everyone's gonna know what happened. Right, but of course I can't even get the phone working. You know, my hands are so sweaty, my phone's slipping through my hands, I'm freaking out. And then we go to land and I'm looking at the air hostess and she's, <laughs> right, irritating and frustrating. Then we go to land and the firemen open their hoses and there's like water on the flight, like on the, on the airplane, and it's gushing at my window. I think, great, there's something on fire right behind me. We're gonna <laughs> die, everyone's gonna die, and people have come out to film it. What is this generation that we live in? Someone help us! And then I can see people, the, all of a sudden, in the middle of the height of things, people just start to relax. And then um, I can see people are talking, talking, there's a message, message, message. And then the person next to me, she leans forward and she gets this message. And then she, ha, 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 ha. And then she turns to me and says, ah. Oh. So what's happening is that this is the first time this model of aeroplane has landed here in Whanganui. And the whole town's excited about it. <laughs> so everyone has come to watch, including the fire department, who decided with their hoses would create a water guard of honor <laughs> that the plane could just travel right on through, that the town just wanted to welcome this model of aeroplane to Whanganui. <laughs> right? <laughs> Whanganui! <laughs> and look, I look, it's, it's slightly funny now, but at the time I genuinely thought I was gonna die. I genuinely, there was fear that had gripped me. I, I did grab my phone because I thought, man, I need to tell my husband I love him and my son that, you know, be a good husband when you grow up, etc. all those things. And the, th and the whole time, the air hostess. And so the word that God gave me at the end of last year was focus. Of all the things that I should have been focusing on, I shouldn't have been focusing on other people's opinions because they can't fly the airplane. I should know that when I'm on a flight, if the captain needs me to know something, he's gonna tell me. If we're ever in trouble, there's no need for stress or worry or anxiety. I can hold my peace because I can see the air hostess and she's sitting there and it's all good. But too many times our opinions are weighted on other people that should have no holding on our lives. But really the, the only thing I should have done is just sat back, relaxed, put in my seatbelt and just chilled out. And until the captain says something, I'm good. And this plane, anything can happen on the outside of this plane, but until there's, until there's time to worry, until there's time to freak out, then it's not time to freak out, and I can have peace. And I think sometimes we don't walk into the life that is full and overflowing with Christ because of our focus that's divided. And so today, I just wanna perhaps share with you some questions that God has asked me to ensure for 2020, my focus is where it should be. My focus is where it needs to be. That my ears are tuned to His Spirit. That my eyes can see what they need to see. That my faith can rise and my spirit can walk forward, right? I just need a focus. And there's so many things that, I, that would just take our focus away, but come on, focus. So there are three, three questions tonight that I wanna ask you uh, that God has been asking me, right? And the first question is this, it's gonna come up on the screen. Uh, the question is this, the question is what is in your hand? 
okay? And if you've been around church long enough, you would know uh, where this question comes from. It would be familiar to you. And this is the space where God has appeared to Moses and he said, come on, Moses, we're gonna free the Israelites who have been in slavery and, and it's gonna be me and you, Moses, let's go. Let's bring freedom to a nation. And this is one of the questions that God asks Moses. He says, Moses, what is in your hand? So let's go to the scripture in Exodus in chapter four, verses two to five. It says this, so the Lord said to him, what is that in your hand? He said, a staff, a shepherd's staff, Moses replied. Okay, yeah, I'll just read it. Um, and he, so he, God said, cast it on the ground. So he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent and Moses fled from it, fear enough. Then the Lord said to Moses, reach out your hand and take it by the tail. As he reached out his hand and caught it, it became a rod again in his hand, that they may believe the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob appeared to you. The question today is what is in your hand? What is in your hand? Not as what is in someone else's hand, what is in your hand? Come on, focus. What is in your hand? What do you have in your hand? What have you got in your life? What is in your hand? The killer of faith can be comparison. Comparison is only good and useful as much that it inspires. And then that's it. it. Someone doing well should just inspire us. But then what happens is comparison sets in and then we become, we, we, we begin to imitate, right? But the question is, what is in your hand? What was in Moses' hand? In his hand was a shepherd's staff. That's because he was a? Good. He was a shepherd. And every shepherd would have a? That's it, that's it. And uh, here, here's the thing, every shepherd had a staff. Wow. That's pretty common, if you didn't know. If shepherds have staffs, <coughs> just like a rod, like a stick. And if you were a shepherd at that time, you would have a staff. And if anything, I think Moses might have thought, well, what is in my hand is rather common. Everyone's got one. And I think sometimes we can think that. What is in my hand? It's common. Everyone's got one. Everyone can do this. Every, here's the thing. Everyone might have a shepherd staff. Everyone might be able to encourage. Everyone might have the gift of hospitality. Everyone might be able to do it. But what is uncommon is that we throw it down before God. Everyone's got it. But what shifts a nation is what we do with what's in our hand. And God doesn't take it off Moses. God invites Moses and says, come on, with what's in your hand, would you throw it down before me? And that is what is the uncommon thing that moves us into a life where we've gone from like shepherding the everyday average to moving into a life that is full and overflowing. What is in your hand? Come on, don't despise small beginnings. Don't despise things that are small. Don't, don't look at what you have and think, oh, that's not enough. Because I think sometimes we live, we're living and we're asking God, more God, give me more, give me more. But we're not doing anything with the less that we've got. God, give me more. I want to live a life of full and overflowing. But what are we doing with that gift of encouragement? What are we doing with that small sentence that's in our heart that you want to reach out to the person you saw in the foyer when you walked in? That, 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 that question that you want to say, hey, how's it going? Can I buy you a coffee? And maybe God might open a door for you. Come on, what is in your hand? And then God says, come on, throw it down. Throw it down. The second phrase that God spoke to me at the end of last year along with the word focus, I said, God, what am I focusing on? And he said, Esther, in 2020, don't do hard things, do impossible things. Don't do hard things, do impossible things. The hard things are the things that we strive for in our own strength. The impossible things are the things we get by way of surrender in the spirit. The hard things are the things that we strive for in our own strength, our own understanding, our own experience, our own intelligence. But the things of the impossible are the things that we get by way of surrender in the spirit. Come on, what do you think next week is about? Next week in the Spark Arena? It is not about hard work and filling an arena. It's a space where we're throwing down and we're saying, God, could you do the impossible? We're gonna bring all that we have, but God, we're not here to make ourselves look good. We wanna see a city saved. We wanna see families restored. We wanna see the supernatural. We wanna see the impossible. We wanna see the lame walk, the blinds. We wanna see a God. We want a God, that's what we're doing. Who cares about filling an arena? But 
that's what, that's what next week is about. Not just about all our campuses coming together as one, but man, that one miracle that God's got in you, in your hand, where you can throw down, send that invite out, have the conversation, go next door, have, invite your neighbor, talk to the person on the bus, go to the service station, catch a train, do whatever you need to do. How do we throw down? That's how we throw down. Okay, I'm just a bit excited. All right. Okay, good times. And then after all that throwing down, right, God says, okay, great, it's turned into a snake. And then God says, pick it up. Anyone picked up a snake lately? Yeah, no. So you all seem rather normal to me. <laughs> I don't like snakes. I don't like spiders. I don't like cicadas. I don't like ants. Right, I don't like moths. I don't like bugs. I don't like any of it. So the, the sheer thought of there being a snake on the ground and God saying, pick it up by the tail. Immediately, these are the thoughts in my mind. Um, no. Um, it could hurt me. If it hurts me, it's going to poison me. I'm going to die. Right? Um, no. I might pick it up, get scared, fling it. Right? And then it might land on someone and kill them and then they're going to die. <laughs> Whatever happens, God, nothing good can come of this. Right? And that's the difference between hard things and impossible things. That's the difference between the flesh and the spirit. Because God, have you ever noticed when you throw down and you take what's in your hand, you say, God, this is what I got, and you throw it down before God. And sometimes it turns into a snake. Sometimes it turns into something scary that we think, if we go near that, that's going to hurt. If we go near that, that just might kill me. If I, if I try and pick up another creative endeavor, when I failed before, I failed many times before, I don't think I could handle that kind of humiliation. Maybe if, so, sometimes it turns into a challenge, a challenge to have a hard conversation with someone that may have broken your heart. Sometimes you throw your life down before God and it turns into a question. Will you take a step forward and lead an e-group this year? Sometimes it turns into something that you think, man, I don't want people to see my home. I don't want people to see how I talk to my husband or my wife or my children. I don't want people to, that might kill me. I just, I just don't want to see people. <laughs> right, any introverts? Yeah, yeah, <laughs> my brother. Well, the other ones are too scared. It's fine, it's fine, we're good, we're good. That's a joke, by the way. It's a myth that introverts don't like people. Introverts actually love people a lot. We just do it one by one. That's all. Anyway, and sometimes it turns into something hard, but here's the thing. Moses, what Moses had to do was step and pick this thing up by the tail while it still had a risk factor attached to it. He had to step over the fear, bend down and pick that thing up while it, in his own understanding, this could kill me. In his own understanding, this might hurt my family. This could hurt anyone that's around me. In my own understanding, the fire engines are out and the firemen have turned on their hose and this is all gonna go to custard. But in our own understanding, in our own flesh, we don't know. We don't know how to operate. But when we step out in faith and we do that, something shifts in our spirit and it transforms in our hand as we go and not before. It transforms in our hand as we go and not before. Okay, good times. Um, I'm just gonna, hey, yeah, yeah, Kimmy, come on up, come on up. She's so ready. And so tonight, again, I, I, I put to you the, that, that first question, question one, what is in your hand? And I pray tonight, come on right now, that even the Spirit of God right, right now would begin to bring to your memory, or He'd begin to speak to your heart, come on, don't look at what you have as small, don't look at what you have as insignificant that in a small seed comes a great harvest. In a small seed comes a great harvest. And if there's anything 
that you might have in your hand. Come on, God can use that. A simple encouragement, a simple invitation. And if you would just take that and throw it down before God, maybe you've done that and the situation has become overwhelmingly fearful. I just believe there's a moment now where the Spirit of God will come in love and would drive away all of that fear and those the, the fear-driven questions. God, what if I get hurt? God, what if this doesn't work out? God, what if, uh, what if things happen and I, I, I don't have control? I can't take this back. This is permanent. But that is love's gonna come in and speak to your heart and say that he'd take care of you. If there's anyone in this room now with every head bowed and eye closed and you're just saying, you know what? May I just, with what is in my hand, I wanna lay it before God. I wanna give it all to God. And I wanna say, God, man, I throw down. I say, what is in my hand is yours. And if you're saying, God, I'll you know, pick up a new dream, go again, hope again, try again, love again, create again, innovate again, step out again, then God, I'm, I'm, I'm in. If that's you tonight, I'm gonna ask you to do something a little bit different and a little bit brave. But while everyone's seated, and you know, I know the Spirit of God is speaking. There are things in your heart that need to be released. Things in your heart that need to be picked up. If that's you, why don't I, I just invite you to respond by faith, by way of standing to your feet and saying, yeah, God, I've got some things I need to give over. I've got some things I thought were insignificant, but I know, God, I know this gift, this talent you've given me. I know you can use it for something greater and I give it to you. So if that's you right now in this moment, just a moment of surrender, I just invite you to just stand with me as a sign of surrender saying, God, I'm, give, I'm gonna give you what's in my hand. Thank you, Jesus. Come on, let go, let go. I just, I know there's tension right now. I know there's tension right now. And I, yeah, I just, I fully believe even this week that even as you decide in this moment now to let go, to send the invitation out, to have a conversation, to, to invite, to welcome people into your house, to start an e-group, whatever it is, whatever those things is, I just believe God's gonna bring an incredible freedom that limitations are not gonna hold you back anymore. So if that's you, come on, there's a moment. Just continue to stand. Jesus, oh Jesus. We surrender. We surrender to you, oh Jesus. Give it all. We give it all to you, Jesus. Everything in our hands, everything in our hearts, we give it all, we give it all to you, Jesus. And right now, in this moment of surrender, I just believe God's love is coming in. He's got your back. Though you might fall, you will not fail. He's got your back. And I just sense a commissioning in the Spirit. Come on, go. Go, go, God's got you. Come on, go, go. Dream again, try again. Send an invitation out again. I just, just around conversation this week. I just believe the Spirit of God is gonna be on conversation this week. Conversation one-on-one -on -one to invite. Conversation one-on-one -on -one to restore relationship. And God is giving you courage now as His love comes in. He's got you, He's got you, He's got you. And we speak to every fear. We speak to every assignment of the enemy that is said to limit every heart. We break that assignment and rebuke that assignment in the name of Jesus. And we just declare, come on, hope rise, courage rise. 
that your word would rise within people's spirits tonight. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I said there were three questions, but I've only got time for two, right? And here's the last question. I, I, I'm going to get you to sit down, right? What year? You can sit down or you can stand. Do whatever you want, to be honest. It's 6, p, 6 p.m. You just do whatever you like. This is the last question. The first question was, what is in your hand? The second question we kind of covered with that, what is in your heart? And this is the third question, what is the one thing? What is the one thing? Let me read you this in Luke in chapter 18. The book of Luke is just speaking to me lately. Luke in chapter 18, verse 18, once a religious leader asked Jesus the question, good teacher, what should I do to inherit eternal life, right? That's a good question. What should I do to live a life that is full and overflowing? What should I do to step into the abundance and all that you've got for me, God? What should I do? And Jesus says this, why do you call me good? Only God is truly good. But to answer your question, you know the commandments. Don't commit adultery, don't murder, don't steal, and don't lie and honor your father and mother. Listen now. Verse 21, the man replied, I've obeyed all these commandments since I was young. I've done it all. I don't do the lying. I don't commit adultery. I don't steal. And maybe here you're like, yeah, what? Yeah, I don't do all those things. I, I come to church, go to e-group. I serve on a team. I do the things. And then Jesus says this, um, verse 22, when Jesus heard his answer, he said, there is one thing you haven't done. Say one thing. There's one thing. One thing you haven't done. Sell all your possessions and give the money to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come follow me. But when the man heard this, he became very sad for he was very rich. Now don't hear what I'm not saying. I'm not saying let's go from here, sell everything we have, right? And give it to Scott. Right? I'm just, I'm not saying that. <laughs> As the Lord leads you, that's a joke, right? That's not what I'm saying. But here's what Jesus is saying. He said, you have done everything. You, you have done all these things, but you have not done one thing. You have not given everything. The one thing is everything. And I think we can give God some things, just not everything. Let me read again. Uh, Luke, not, not again, Luke in chapter two, 21 and verses 1. To four. While Jesus was in the temple, he watched rich people dropping their gifts in a collection box. Then a poor widow came by and dropped in two small coins. I tell you the truth, Jesus says, this poor woman has given more than all the rest of them, for they have given a tiny part of their surplus. But she, poor as she is, has given, she, as poor as she is, has given you have given a tiny part of your surplus, but she has given everything. That's the point. Come on, let's not trip. We live in a society of surplus, surplus resource, surplus time, surplus everything. We've got everything at our fingertips. And here, I just, I don't wanna, I don't wanna live the kind of life that says, okay, God, I'm gonna wake up in the morning and I'm gonna give you 30 minutes of my time. That's a great thing to do. And I'm gonna tick that off, and then the rest of the time, that's mine. God, I'm gonna give you 10% of my income because that's what you've asked me to do. I'm gonna tick the box, and then the 90%, I will do whatever I want with it. That is what it is to give out of your surplus, but not give everything. Here is what giving everything looks like. God, I'm gonna give you 30 minutes of my time in the morning. And then after that, I'm gonna humbly come before you. And I'm gonna say, God, with every minute of every hour today, I'm a, I wanna walk with you. I wanna hear you. I wanna see you. I wanna move with you, God. I wanna spend every minute. God, just hearing what you've got to say and walking with you, it's different. God, God, I give you 10% of my money. I give you 10% of my money. And with the other 90, though I have every right 
to do whatever I want with it. Instead, I humbly come before you and I say, God, with the surplus of my resource, God, whatever you want me to do, whoever you want me to encourage, however you want me to invest, however you want me to work out with this money, that's what giving everything is about. Too many times we give God some of our life and just not all of it. And this is what Jesus says, you missed out. You missed out, rich man, because you live a life of surplus. You live a life where you've got an excess of things. Come on, even if you're a student, you think, I don't have excess. Yes, you do. You have so many two-minute noodles. There's excess. So many bowls of rice. So many loaves of one dollar bread. I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you this story, and I just feel so strongly about this, right? Because this is one of the things I learned as a teenager, and it's just held me that I may not have much, but with what I have, God, I give to you. I remember just getting saved and falling in love with Jesus, and He giving me hope. And he given me the chance to live a life that I never thought I could live. And then someone gave me a microphone and said, want to sing on team? I said, yo, I don't know how to sing, but sweet. Right, they gave me a microphone. And, and I, I remember in, in youth, when, I, when they used to let me sing, I would finish high school and I'd catch the bus from Epsom Girls in Newmarket all the way to the Mercury Theatre. I would ask Pastor Isaac to open up the Merc for me and I would wait for sound check at six o'clock. And in the time that I would wait for sound check, I remember being in the upper lounge as a 16 year old and being on my knees and just saying, God, I, I don't know why they gave me a microphone, but they gave it to me. But whatever I have, I wanna give to you. And if, you know, back in those days, my mom, my mom and dad, they gave me pocket money. They gave me $40 for two weeks. Yeah, you think, wow, that's amazing. That $40 I had to pay to get myself to and from school and any sort of activity that I wanted to do, I had to tithe. And then with the $3 I had left, I could do whatever I want with it. So after I bought my train tickets and after I tithed, I had $3. And I remember on Fridays, I remember after praying, I'd walk up to the dairy and I would buy three $1 packet of lollies. Right? Yeah, you know. Yeah, the students. Those $1 sugar rushes, three $1 packs of lollies, and then I would walk into the Mercury Theatre as young people would stream in. I wasn't the most confident, and I was broken, and I was scared, but I just knew Jesus. And with these three bags of lollies, I would just stand there. God, who can I share this with? Out of the little that I had, I learned the principle of not giving some things, but giving everything. I don't have much. I've only got three bags of lollies. And I just remember I would just sit. Nothing miraculous happened, but I would turn and it would be the sense of worship in me. As I would say, oh, you want some? Okay. Yeah, you can pass it down the aisle. All good. And I bring out another pack. Oh, you want some? Yeah, you can pass it down the aisle. All good. I would eat one. You want some? <laughs> And the point is, I think we can give a lot of our lives to Jesus, just not all. And if we're ever gonna see a city in revival, it doesn't happen in part. It doesn't happen halfway in, halfway out. It happens when we give everything. Come on, university student. I know you're here to get a degree. But if you would realize that you're not just here to get a degree, but that God could use you in the most extraordinary ways by you just giving simply what you have, but the point is giving everything.